Welcome everyone and welcome Kunal. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, so I am trying to introduce you to our audience, but I find that all definitions of you are somewhat circular. So I'm going to give this a shot. You grew up with communist parents. You railed against imperialist forces in your youth. And then you went off to Canada and the US and now you live in the UK. So, but we're not talking politics. So I'm just going to go on to the next part of your life. You were quite literally born on the floor of your author mom's library. And you grew up under the influence of the entire Bengal culturati, if there is such a word. Filmmakers like Satyajit Ray and Rinal Sen and theater makers and authors and artists. And so of course, you have not just a bachelor's, but also a master's in engineering. So, uh, and then you became a copywriter and a part-time actor. And then you follow this up with a PhD and a 10 year professorship, not in literature, not in creative writing, uh, but in marketing in the Oxford, um, the side business school at Oxford. So, however, your most projected identity is that of an author a very successful author, of course, one of very few Indian practitioners of historical fiction and the only writer writing in Bengali and English today. So I want to start the conversation by first congratulating you on the release of your latest book, uh, In an Ideal World. Thank one you. of So there's a journalist who says it's about the courage of compassion in two competing visions of India. Hmm nothing we need more of in the world today. So how much of this beautifully rich and complex three-dimensional existence was driven by economics? Um, very little, really. My, my life makes no sense on paper. <laughs> um, I wouldn't advise anybody to follow in my footsteps. Um, you know, at the time when we were growing up in India, when I was growing up in India, uh, in a middle-class family, if you didn't study engineering, or medicine, then you became uh, unemployed. Hmm. And there was not an option for me. So I ended up studying all the wrong subjects. I hated science, I took science. I hated engineering, I studied engineering. M my biggest difficulty, Vinita, was this. I was a damn good student. Hmm. So no matter what subject I was asked to take a test in, I did very well which of course is no testament to actual talent. All that it speaks to is that I had good test-taking skills, you know? And, and a few gray cells. <laughs> right, few, only just a few. And I sort of managed to, uh, you know, did a degree in engineering without any love for engineering whatsoever. I spent all my time in theater and in writing and, and things of that nature and politics uh, and, uh, and then when I got an, a scholarship to study in the US for my master's, I said, fantastic. Uh, uh, who is going to, who in their right minds is going to pay me to travel around the world at their expense? And I'll do a master's, that's not a big problem. So I went and did a master's. I worked in Cape Canaveral in the space project. So I was a rocket scientist. And I said, look, this is not really what I want to do. So I went back to India, started acting in, you know, in theater, uh, cinema and all of that. And in the 80s, that couldn't put food on the table. So that's where the economics started kicking in to some extent. Um, and, uh, and I said, well, look, I need to find a career which is the least disruptive of the arts. Okay. And so I took a strategic decision, not a passionate decision. Mm -hmm. And the strategic decision was, well, you know, what if I did a PhD? And then if I became a professor, then I would be my own boss. I could control my time. And if I could become efficient, maybe I could have a serious pursuit of writing going alongside my career. And so that's what I did. So uh, your how... first book... Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Your first book, The Opium Clark, was published in 2001. Right. But when... When do you think in all of this strategizing was Kunal the author born? Well, really, um, when I, uh, you know, it was very, very coincidental. So there was this non-resident Indian business school professor who was visiting Kolkata. And I met him socially and he said, what are you up to these days? I said, well, I'm a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And he said, well, have you considered doing a PhD in, in management? 
And I said, what is that? Isn't, isn't that, you know, I actually said this, isn't that terribly unintellectual? And he said, no, 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 I'll give you a few papers to read. And he gave me a couple of papers to read and it was very quantitative, very analytical. And in those days, I could do my math with my eyes closed. So I said, I can do it. And, and notice the words, I'd never said, I want to do this. I said, I can do this. Okay. And so the, that's when it all started coming together. All right. So a PhD in business and obviously booming job market. Okay. Uh, and I would uh, take a position as a, as, a, as a professor in some business school, in a, in a research kind of a business school, which will give me enough time to write. And so that's when it, it, was, it st slowly started taking shape. And I told myself, look, as soon as I make tenure, which I did at McGill, uh, I'm going to start writing and it's not going to be Sunday writing for me. I, I don't pursue hobbies. I have no hobbies. Either I do it or I don't do it. And so that's what I did. I did. I made my made tenure and uh, professors, when they make tenure, they you know, go to another university, spend a year, you know, do more research with colleagues. I shut myself in my room for two years and I wrote uh, The Opium Clerk. Clearly, you were fulfilling all the other side of your duties phenomenally well for yeah. people to be happy in your tenureship. So, but so the desire to be an author was there for a while. And then that that whole process of of putting yourself in a place where you could be an author. That's right. Happened with um, phenomenal, phenomenal. So. The Miniaturist followed in 2003, The Racists in 2006, and then a collection of short stories, The Japanese Wife in 2008. And so Aparna Sen decided to make a movie out of the short story, The Japanese Wife. Why do you think she chose that particular story out of everything that you had written up until then? You know, it's, it's baffling to me. Um, I had written this short story and put it away in my desk drawer. Because there is this, uh, there's this view in England. Uh, by then, I had moved to 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 Oxford. Um, and the view, my my agent uh, view was, one establishes oneself first as a novelist, and then publishes one's collection of short stories. If one writes short stories, that is. So I'd written the Japanese wife and a bunch of other stories, and they were all in my desk drawer. I was not intending to publish them at any point in time, uh, in, anytime soon. Um, and then I again met Aparna Sen socially in, in, in Oxford. She'd come to visit. And uh, I remember she, she walked up through the, uh, the crowd in a party and said, ah, I, was, I so wanted to meet you because The Miniaturist is my favorite novel. And we're all open to flattery, you know? We're all, you know, so uh, I, I felt- Really? Hmm, surprising, no. <laughs> so, so, I, <laughs> so I, um, I was quite charmed. And then she said, you know, um, I'd really like to make a love story, but all good love stories have been told, you know, Romeo and Juliet and, and, and all that. I wasn't pitching a film to her because I didn't know what pitching for a film meant at that time in my life. So I said, no, hang on. I think I have a short story, which is a love story, which is very different from others. And she said, go on, tell me. And so here we are in this room uh, with, uh, with lots of people drinking wine and you know, making social, you know, I was chit chat, and in about seven minutes, I told her the story of the Japanese wife, and she said, "Ah, have you have you sold it to anyone?" I said, "No." Uh, so, would, would you would you please send it to me uh, as as an you know as an email attachment? And I did, and then she came back and said, I, "I'd love to make this film." I guess what appealed to her, which she has said later in, in many 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 interviews, is that. The absolute surreal premise of the story, which brought forth a kind of innocence, which is, uh, which is quite surprising, which is um, not, not frequently encountered. And in, in many ways, it was a very pristine kind of a love story, albeit a very unusual one. Um, and that's how the film came about. Incredible. So, um... You said that you teach at the side business school in Oxford, you teach marketing. Do you think of yourself as a successful entrepreneur in the arts? And entrepreneur, uh, which is the subject of our summit today. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of my colleagues who teach entrepreneurship, as you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a very established uh, discipline. Uh, in, in most business schools, we have a good center for entrepreneurship at, this, at Said as well. Um, I have never actually thought about, my, considered myself to be an entrepreneur. And I'll tell you why. Because to be an entrepreneur, one leaks, needs to uh, be very conscious of one's environment, uh, the business environment, uh, the nature of the marketplace, the nature of competition. I mean, we teach all of this in class, by the way, and, 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 and so forth. Whereas as, uh, as a creative person, as a writer, I've looked inside. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked outside. I wrote my first novel, which was a historical novel. What kind of an author writes a debut novel, which is a historical novel? You know? A good one, clearly. <laughs> yeah, very unusual, okay. I wasn't gauging taste. I wasn't, you know, which is what entrepreneurs should do. Uh, I wasn't looking for gaps in the marketplace. I was, wasn't, I had certainly no clue, zero clue about literary publishing. I understood a lot about academic publishing, but had zero clue about uh, literary publishing. It was, I was propelled to write, and I was propelled to write this story, which I accidentally thought of off in a, while I was traveling, uh, actually hiking in Northern Thailand, mm -hmm. uh, and said, well, this is the story I need to tell. Uh, and so uh, not an entrepreneur in the classical sense of the term. Uh, although, uh, you know, I now have what, 15 books, 16th in the pipeline, uh, and so there is a world of enterprise around me uh, in terms of publishers, agent, foreign rights, what have you. But uh, as I was starting out writing, and even now when I think of a new novel to write, I pay no attention to the world. I pay no attention to readership. I'm trying to satisfy myself. That's... Um... That's, that's a really interesting response, Kunal, because we seem to live in a world where uh, things have changed to the point where, you know, art, business, media, technology, everything is converging. And, and yet you manage to remain uh, in, despite living in both sides of this world, you, you manage to remain disparate in, in your creative output and your strategic output as you defined it. So are you unusual in that respect? Or do you think that um, most authors are like that? Um, increasingly, I find um, um, quite a few authors um, playing a very active role in uh, sort of taking their work through uh, you know, channels of distribution uh, into, into readers, and they do all kinds of things. And look, You've got, you've got authors and you've got authors. You know? uh, different people have different personas. Um, I think what works best for me is that I'm able to live in my world, uh, you know, my mind, my heart, my feelings, my, my memories, my experiences, and also the world as I experience um, um, in everyday life. And I'm very deeply engaged with everyday life uh, wherever I live. In, in Kolkata, I avoid, uh, you, know, be, uh, you know, traveling in a car. Uh, I walk everywhere. And if, I, if the destination is too far, I take Uber. Uh, I go to, to, to the market. I sit, go to tea shops. Uh, uh, I have extreme curiosity about this world. And um, I'm a very high risk tolerance. I put myself in situations which normally people shouldn't put themselves in. Um, and uh, trying... And in, in order to sort of in the quest of stories, in, in order to find things, you know, find the unfamiliar within the familiar. And I feel that in doing all of this, uh, uh, it's, it, I'm so absorbed in it that it actually doesn't pay me to think about how is this work going to be received? What do I need to do to publicize it? And very fortunately, I have a support system around that. I do have an agent. and. Um, uh, publishers uh, usually uh, uh, play a very strong role in positioning their authors and doing things like that. So I haven't had to do it and I haven't had to pay a lot of attention to it. If you were able to identify perhaps one overriding uh, quality uh, 
in you or situation in your life which led to um, all the success and, and you having a life, not just as an author, but as so many other things. What would you say that was? Um, without question, it would be uh, my bullheadedness. <laughs> you know, uh, it is uh, uh, dancing to one's own drummer. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't say this uh, in arrogantly or egotistically because, you know, in, in dancing to one's own drummer, one can slip and fall on the dance floor. Hmm. And there's always that possibility uh, that I write something and it just doesn't work. Okay. Very much a possibility. Um, but I, I think what has carried me through all these years, through all these twists and turns uh, of the career and also my writing life is that I've tried to listen to my own voice. Mm. I've not tried to imitate anyone. I've not tried to say, well, geez, if I could, if I could just do it the way this person did, you know. You don't want and, to be the next Tagore or the next Shakespeare or the next. No, no, no. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm happy being who I am. And, uh, Actually, I'm unhappy being who I am. I do want to do better. I want to write um, much better than what I've managed to do so far. So it's always a project, uh, incomplete project. Uh, but I, I, I follow it with a lot of doggedness. I write 12 hours a day, 13 hours a day, every day, every day, except the days when I'm traveling. And do you sleep? <laughs> I do sleep. I sleep very well. Uh, what it means is, uh, we need this, that I don't have uh, a, a raging social life, unfortunately. Well, you have a lot of very interesting people around you. They're just in your head, and, and um, that's a social life, I yeah. think. Uh, I have two youth-oriented questions for you. The first one, what would Kunal, the author, today tell Kunal, the engineering student at Jadapur University, if he could go back in time and oh talk. gosh so many things yeah. uh, you know um sometimes people I, I i've heard a lot of people say oh i got no regrets mm. okay my life is full of regrets okay so if i could be a revisionist historian and go back and change my life i would say kunal are you crazy what on earth are you doing studying engineering when you have no desire to be an engineer okay so I would say, you know, uh, take, you should have taken the risk early on in your life because, you know, it, it, when, you, when you take risks early on and if those risks don't come true, you still have time to recover. If you take risks very late in life, then it becomes that much more difficult to recover if one fails. Uh, so I would tell Kunal, you know, just uh, drop out. Just drop out of your engineering college and, um, and try. And uh, at that point, I actually wanted to be an actor. So I played, you know, I had some uh, some roles in cinema, and also. Yes, well, that I remember. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I grew up in Calcutta, so I know this. <laughs> you, know, you know this, right? So the group theatre was really active. I used to act for a group uh, um, run by Utpal Dottu, who was a very very famous actor and theatre director. And he really wanted me to go and um, and offered me to go, uh, go with him to Bollywood, and and act. But of course, in the 80s, the Bollywood was very different to what, we, what it is now. And I didn't quite fancy uh, singing and dancing around a tree. Uh, and so it wouldn't have worked for me. So I would have told uh, uh, a young Kunal uh, to be much more self-reflective, mm -hmm. uh, to be uh, far, uh, to recognize uh, his uh, real passion and to pursue that, um, you know, take advice from others, but actually pursue that uh, you know, early on and not so go the circuitous route. So if there was a devil sitting on your shoulder which said, uh, this is the wrong advice to give Kunal the engineering student because Kunal the engineering student then had a, an economically relatively stable life and still got to the point where Kunal became a celebrated author, works being read everywhere, being turned into movies, um, where would that rebuttal come? That would it be that the challenge uh, to pursue your passion bullheadedly, three hundred and sixty degrees, uh, will define you so much better as an artist that you cannot but be successful? 
what would be the argument that you know you you would tell the devil on your shoulder then? No, no, I'm I, I, a fair, fair question. You know, um, becoming unemployed or being uh, you know uh, living on a pittance uh, would have been problematic. Yeah, uh, <laughs> or from from a family point of view, and also I mean, you know, married relatively early. Uh, our daughter was born right away, and so. Um, it, it was, uh, it, it, I, had, we, we, I had to be financially viable. So all of these factors did play into the decision. I don't want to be blithe about it um, at all. Um, but I think, uh, it, you know, I, if I dedicated myself early on into my real passion, mm -hmm. then perhaps I would also, I could have become economically successful doing what I, uh, what I really wanted to do. Now, I will never know that. One will never know that whether that would be would have been possible at all, uh, but I think I would have been happier. Mm. You know, um, it, it, to to be a closet writer, whereas when one masquerades being somebody else is not fun. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, you've just destroyed all my notion of fun masquerades now. Okay. <laughs> I, I told you I had a two-part youth question. So we talked to Kunal back at Jadapur University uh, in engineering college, and you told him, do drop out. Um, do you have the same advice for people with a passion for art inside them today? Because um, I'm sure you get asked this much more than I do because you're a professor. Um, you know, we're at the age where children we have children and, and they're making decisions about the career. And do we tell them the world has changed and, and artists um, make a viable living now. And so go out and follow your passion. Or do we say, look, just go to college with a backup, get a backup degree and then go find yourself, but you can come back to economic stability. If um, it, it is every parent's dilemma when, mm. when trying to guide um, youth into, especially South Asian parents, when trying to guide youth into um, education when clearly engineering, doctoring, lawyering is not the path that the child wants to take. No, it's a, it's a very fair concern. I mean, I don't want to <clears throat> be casual about it at all. It's a very fair concern. I'll only say this, you know, it's, it's very difficult to make a return. To one's passion mm. because uh, uh, careers these days are very challenging very competitive mm. and if one commits oneself in a certain path then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy it becomes very difficult as you know the only credit i give myself Benita, i don't give myself many credits the only yeah. credit the only credit i give myself is that i never let go of my dream mm. i never let go of my passion and I said, look, I need economic viability. I certainly do. And that comes with tenure. Okay. But as soon as I make tenure, that's what I'm, what I'm going to do is pursue my career, my, my writing career. And there are some real sacrifices. You know, uh, this may not be the forum to talk about the sacrifices, but uh, it seems um, simple enough to say, ah, you're, you're a professor at Oxford University. You're also a writer. Isn't that just wonderful? Okay. No. It doesn't not, seem simple at all. It's, it's a exactly, lot of work. <laughs> exactly. So, the, so there are costs to bear. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I've, I've borne some of those costs, but I'm really happy to bear them again because, you know, it allowed me to do what I really wanted to do. Yeah. But uh, it, to your point, it's a very difficult advice to give somebody. Very difficult advice to give somebody. And what, what I would say is that, look, don't jump into it. Okay. Take time. These days, people take gap years. <clears throat> go and work for a theater company. If that's your passion. You know, go to a creative one-year creative writing program to see if that works out for you. Uh, you know, sort of poke around a bit, experiment a little, a little bit, uh, without sinking the ship. And during that process, if you find that something really resonates strongly inside you, and only you can be the judge of that, and if it really resonates strongly with you, then take the plunge. Do you think uh, in, in, you know, today's day in, in 2022, uh, as compared to 25 years ago or 50 years ago, uh, it is much more 
economically, financially viable and easier to be in an artistic profession, especially since so much uh, of, of artistic expression has gone digital and the world of technology has a return um, that is a few magnitudes higher because oh, of oh absolutely music. absolutely I, I talk about purely from the, the level of auth at the, at the, uh, with respect to authorship uh, you know if somebody is writing an author okay uh, but it's still food needs to be on the table right uh, there are all kinds of you know people are flooded with freelance work now with with respect to digital stuff that is going on uh, if you purely look at india the uh, when we were growing up there was only one television channel which was doordarshan <clears throat> like there's so many channels which means what which means that these channels are monsters they need to be constantly fed they need to be fed with content so the need for content writing in a whole variety of domains is incredibly high okay and so one can make a handy income on the side as one is sort of squirting away and writing one's novel. In my time, it was not possible to do that. Okay. So, so yes, there are more options now. <clears throat> some of the, the other speakers on our panels might take objection to your last statement because for them, this is not on the side. This is their artistic endeavor. So um, Fair enough. It's um, how pure does one stay to the art that you are pursuing while being an entrepreneur, managing your economic finances? And... Um, you know, I can only speak for myself. Um, everything about my life has been, I have crafted, and Shushmita has been a huge, huge, huge help. Without her, I don't know how I would have been able to swim through these very murky waters. Uh, is I've crafted everything around my passion, okay? <clears throat> where I stay, how I stay, where do I, which parts of the world do I visit? I mean, I, uh, depending on the novel that I'm writing, if it is located in a certain place, I would go and live there for a while. Just pick up and go. Mm -hmm. I wrote a novel called The Yellow Emperor's Cure, which is about a Portuguese doctor who goes to China to find a cure for syphilis in the 19th century. So as you can imagine, I spent time in, in, in Portugal, I spent time in China uh, uh, purely for that. Uh, in the last section of The Miniaturist, uh, which uh, the novel ends in Eastern Turkey, I went and spent time in Eastern Turkey, in Cappadocia. So uh, I've tried to fashion my life to the extent possible around my writing and, there, and, and the purity of my life comes from that. Now, do we, do, do, does one have to make compromises and adjustments? Of course, okay. Uh, you know, there, you know, if I'm, if I'm, I, was, I remember once I was a keynote speaker at the Berlin, <clears throat> at the Frankfurt Book Fair, and uh, my dean asked me to teach a very special course for senior executives exactly on those dates, exactly on those dates. Okay, and I so I, I <clears throat> had to let Frankfurt Book Fair go because that was my place of employment. Yeah. So yes, I I, I do compromise. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not averse to that, but uh, the core of what I do is around my writing. <clears throat> Phenomenal. Keep that core going because we love reading what you write. Um, any final words for budding authors about to write their first novel? We have maybe a half minute or a minute. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, I don't really, I've never been to a creative writing program and <clears throat> don't quite know whether they're helpful. They might be for some people. Uh, but uh, the only advice I would give, uh, you know, the three things I would tell somebody who, who wants to write, okay. One is read as broadly as you can, okay. I mean, all of us have our favorite genres, but read as broadly as you can, because then you will know what are the, the, the parameters of your, of, of your liking or your disliking, okay? Make it a habit of writing continuously, okay? And if you can't get started on a, on a novel, get started on a story, get started on, a, you know, on an essay about something, write a longish letter to somebody who you know, uh, just the habit of writing and dealing with words every day, okay? 
uh, is sort of keeping the engine going. And the third is be a tiny bit arrogant. What it means is have a lot of self-confidence. Okay. You are you, you're unique. Your voice is unique. There's much to learn from others, but ultimately you will stand on the power of your pen. That's just beautiful. You are you, you are unique, you are powerful, you said. Um, wow, I could just go on and on asking you questions and just, you know, imbibing inspiration from you. But um, that is all the time we have today. And I really, really want to thank you for being part of the summit. Um, I understand you're in some remote part of India right now. Uh, doing a lich fest at uh, a management school. Which... No, that, that that was Zoom. That was Zoom. <laughs> and but I will be in Rachi, which is not too remote, uh, day after tomorrow for a literary festival, and then Jaipur, and then and then the floodgates open. Many many other places. Well, I wish you many many open floodgates, and we are looking forward to book after book from you. Thank you, Kunal, and keep writing. Thank Have you so much time. for having me.